really, really getting clear on, okay, who is your target market and what is like them, the, what is like the one most valuable thing that you can help them with in the simplest way possible. Um, so I know a lot of people, when they create their first course, they create what I call a kitchen sink course. So it's just like, and, and again, this comes from this feeling of not being worthy enough to charge you know, enough. And so you're like, I'm just gonna teach everything I've ever learned about <laughs> anything on this topic. And all you do is fire hose people and it's just becomes too much. And that's when you get like people don't complete and they don't, you know, so it's actually better to ha- come up with like the courses that seem to take off really quickly are the ones that are like super simple. Welcome to Social Post, a podcast brought to you by Meet Edgar. Each week, we bring you a guest to inspire your creativity, breathe new life into your marketing strategy, and get you motivated to take action in your business. Whether you're just starting out or a seasoned entrepreneur, you'll walk away feeling like you took your social media marketing multivitamin. Enjoy the interview and remember, what's possible for them is possible for you. And we can't wait to see your success. Social Post is brought to you by the social media automation tool, Meet Edgar. We are an evergreen social media scheduler that connects with Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Pinterest to save you up to eight hours a week and get more eyes on your content. So head on over to meetedgar.com and sign up for a seven-day trial. Use code SOCIALPOST upon checkout to get a free month. Now let's go on to the episode with Kate McKibben. Welcome back to Social Post, a podcast brought to you by me, Edgar. Today, we're lucky to be joined by Kate McKibben, who is going to give us a wealth of knowledge all around funnels. Now, Kate runs a website called Hello Funnels, and I am so excited to dive into her knowledge. So I'm going to pass it over to Kate to get started here and give us a little more information about who she is and what she does, and then we'll dive into a fun conversation. So Kate, go right ahead. Alrighty, thank you, Megan. Thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, so basically, my business is called Hello Funnels. It is business probably three point two for me. Love it. <laughs> um, I actually started out in um, as a fashion blogger, believe it or not, and rocking the rocking the yoga pants and the UGG boots most days these days. Um, but you know, from that, I sort of you know obviously learned a lot, learned that business model is super hard, uh, then discovered, started experimenting with online education products and then got really, really obsessed with finding ways to sell them that didn't involve launching because I just found personally that launches were really um, stressful and you know meant you didn't have time to do much else. And um, yeah, so I became all very, very obsessed with funnels and figuring out the easiest and simplest ways to make them like I'm a nerd. So it seemed kind of like to make sense to me, but I found a lot of people thought they were quite scary and intimidating. And so I've really loved spending time trying to break them down. So they're actually really um, just little bite-sized chunks, little things people can add in just to make their business run smoother and give them a more reliable revenue and all of that stuff that just really makes business feel a little bit lighter and easier and more stable as well. That's so great. Lighter, easier, and more stable. All words that I certainly would love in my business. So (laughs) as we're talking a little bit about your business, I'd love to start this conversation out actually with your Instagram strategy, because scrolling through your Instagram account, you guys have over 16,000 followers, and it is just a pleasure to be on and so fun to read. I found myself laughing and really wanting to click through and read more of your captions. Can you talk to me about how Instagram plays into your business and how you kind of think about Instagram in a way that is related to funnels and how you actually get your followers on Instagram to convert to actually being like on your email list or paying for one of your courses or services? Yeah, absolutely. And um, thank you. I'm so glad you like it. Uh, So, I mean, for us, we've obviously been playing with a lot of things and I actually have a small team who helped me out with the, uh, with creating the content because I also have a small baby. So there's just not enough time in, in the day anymore. <laughs> um, but really, you know, I found um, when we were coming up, like what kind of content we want to include, it's like, what is the kind of content we actually enjoy consuming ourselves? Mm. Um, and, 
you know, there's lots of different kinds, you know, people have lots of different styles on Instagram, but, you know, we always try and do everything with a little bit of sense of humor and, you know, just try and make everything sort of snackable and fun. And um, as I said, like, with, you know, we're talking about what's really kind of pretty dry topic when you think about marketing automation. So it's always like, how can we make this more lighthearted, more, you know, a bit cheeky, um, less scary. And so that's kind of what we've always tried to do. And, you know, and we're, we're all about the repurposing the content as well. Like I know that's, you know, as, as you guys are, um, and just finding, you know, you know, new ways of, you know, taking, you know, maybe content that we've used in a blog post and how we can then turn that into a couple of posts and have them sort of scattered throughout the upcoming months and keep sending people back to different um, content because our, yeah, pretty much all of our content's evergreen. So um yeah, that's, that's kind of our, that, that answers your question. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I love that idea of being approachable. And like you said, taking something that might be a little stale to talk about and putting that humor in it. So it is interesting. Um, so as we're going along and we're thinking about social media and bringing people into our email so that we can nurture them a little bit further, what are some of your tips if people are just getting started introducing their brand through email marketing um, to their followers or to people who are interested? in their products or services. Can you talk to me about how we should structure our email sequence um, and your thought process around really effective emails? Yeah, sure. So I think that everyone, I mean, your email sequence can end up being as long or as short as you want. And some people tend to build on them, but I think everyone should start with at least five emails. Um, okay. And, you know, it's just a really good way of having enough time to indoctrinate people so that, you know, once they've opted in for whatever your freebie is, you know, they've then sort of seen you pop up in their inbox enough that they kind of go, oh yeah, I remember I opted into this, in, you know, into this list. I asked to be communicated to, because I know quite often um, people will create this amazing opt-in and then nothing, they might send one email and then nothing. And then right. when they do start emailing people, they're like, unsubscribe, unsubscribe, like, who are you? Uh, so you have to show up often enough, I think at the start to, for them to remember that, you know, you're actually something that they were, uh, that they put their hand up for in the first place. And through doing that, you also have a great opportunity to also create provide great value to really sort of position yourself as an expert to connect with them. And you can do that so in something as simple as having five emails drip fed to go out one email a day after they've first opted in. Um, we normally recommend that people, the way they set up these five emails, and again, you can do this in kind of any order, but obviously the, the first email that goes out, you want to give them like a little intro to you, um, really get a bit of your personality across, talk about why you're so passionate about this topic. And if you've got a little bit of story, um, don't put paragraphs and paragraphs of like your mm. um, education or work experience. Like people don't care about that. Pretending you send, remember you're emailing a human, not a HR team so you know even if you do have some really important credentials maybe just sprinkle them and just lightly touch on them because people will just skim um including photos is always good as well because again people tend to you know big chunks of text they're just going to skim over it so keeping it like short short sentences okay sprinkle some photos so that would be email number one um, email number two is you want to come in with some really great value. Like it's almost like sending them a second gift. It's like, if you've got like another great opt-in, maybe you want to send to them, or if you've done a free training or, you know, that there was a really killer video that everyone just raved about, like send them that. Um, then I like to think about what is the most asked question that someone will ask, um, that is like a potential client, like, and it doesn't necessarily have to be about your program. It's more like, what is that thing that they're usually stuck on or they're searching for an answer for? I would make that email number three, like answer that for them and say, look, I know a lot of people want to know this or are looking for this. And this is how I do it. Um, the fourth one I like to do, I call it a BS buster. I don't know if you guys have a little bit of language on this podcast or not, but basically it's just, think again of like, what is one of those things that people believe is like the right way to do something or is like, maybe it's like an outdated kind of model or an outdated kind of, like obviously everyone's niche is kind of different, but there's always something that, you know, you know, it annoys you that like people think this is how they get results and they do it and they don't get results. And then they think the whole industry is rubbish or whatever. Like think about what that thing is and just get up on your soapbox and, and let them know. And, and the purpose of that email, again, is to also show them that you've got a different perspective on things and that perhaps in the past, if they've tried stuff and it hasn't worked, it's not necessarily there. It doesn't, 
that, you know, it's not their fault so much. It's perhaps they've tried something that's no longer that relevant anymore. Mm. Um, and then email number five is usually, we're up to number five, <laughs> um, is just, again, getting them to, I normally think about what's one of your, somewhere on the, like on your social media, or uh, if it's a blog post, it's got lots of engagement. I tend to like to send them there and ask them to like leave a comment or to answer or to sort of engage there if they can. So the call to actions, like, you know, it, again, it kind of shows them, and also you're directing all this traffic to this one post, it's going to keep getting more and more engagement. Um, but it just kind of helps to get them to start the conversation and to start, mm-hmm. you know, then you, you know, you've got that lovely excuse of going, Hey, come and follow me on Instagram. There's this amazing post over here. I love to hear what you think. You know, we're all kind of talking about X, Y, Z. Um, so I kind of like double ticks that box as well. And of course, throughout that, you know, you should be sprinkling in a little bit of talking about client success stories and your offers and, you know, things like that. But just, I think you keep it kind of subtle for those first five emails. It's just really about, um, Give it, yeah, giving good value and getting them to sort of be glad that they opted in for your, for your emails and then be excited for the emails that kind of come after that. Yeah, I can tell how these would create such a good story for people to follow along with. Now, would you recommend sending these five emails back to back, like one a day for a week, or is there a better cadence that you'd recommend for that? Yeah, I go once a day and we've actually okay. extended our own out to the first 14 days um, okay. of weekly. And we find that the open rates are still super high all the way through. Um, and then obviously after that, you know, we've got a couple of funnels that we pop people through and then they hop onto our normal um, newsletter list. So, um, but I think, you know, it's one of those things that seems to, to ebb and flow with whether it's like, you know, email people more is better or email people less is better. And everyone's business is going to be slightly different. So definitely... Right test it for yourself but um from what we've seen it's definitely the particularly at that start point where i think people are just so busy and it's hard to get remember it's not just hard to get noticed it's hard to get remembered Mm. um and i think it's you know you want people when they see your your name pop into their inbox be like oh i wonder what they've got for me today not like oh you know i've got to get around to unsubscribing from them so i think it's just yeah creating like a little welcome party in their inbox for them, basically. (laughs) That's such a good way of looking at it for sure. So you have mentioned a couple of times here, automating this email sequence and doing things like evergreen in your business and really reusing content. And I can tell that you guys have a lot of systems set up because of the massive amount of prolific content on your website. Do you have any tips for people who are just getting started in the content creation process on how you do this, that you're continuing to pump out really awesome content targeted right at your audience, um, but stay sane and still have time to have a life? Like what are your structures and systems that really help you do this? Yeah, sure. So I think at the start, um, particularly if you're doing it by yourself, like if you don't have, like if you can get a little bit of help, it's always amazing. If like a VA, even just to help with the scheduling or to help someone who can go and find what's done well in the past and sort of, you know, can pre-fill a couple of things for you by repurposing and, or, you know, grabbing snippets from blog posts or something that's like even if it's two to three hours a week it's time so well spent but if that's not quite where people are at yet then I would recommend that they come up with a schedule that actually is achievable for them and something that they can realistically sit down like once either a fortnight or a month for a couple of hours and be able to kind of do all the things that they they need to do Um, and I think a lot of people don't you know they make things harder for themselves and they need to be like what, how we normally do it is we start with our, well, we do podcasts now, but it used to just be straight blog posts. But you know, start with what that topic is. Um, sorry. No worries. <laughs> it's very nice. um, so we start with whatever that topic is. And then we, from that, we'll, you know, once we've written that blog post, we then take a snippet out and use like one or two snippets as social posts. Mm-hmm. We use like the intro from the blog post as our newsletter. So it's not creating, oh my gosh. Sorry, I don't actually know how to mute that because it's in the phone. <laughs> <laughs> they don't tell Real me. phones, who knew? <laughs> I know. Um, and yeah, so it's it's about you know, trying to work with what you have, what you can do and you can do consistently. Because I think people say, 
if you set yourself up from the start to succeed, then you're going to enjoy the process. But if it's like every month, it kind of gets to that point of like, oh my gosh, what am I going to write about? Then it's so much harder. And I've also found it makes life a lot easier if you come up with a couple of buckets of content. So, you know, if you go, all right, so we need three funny memes every month, or we need three, um, you know, we're going to do three Q and A or two Q and A's and three like teaching things. And then you sit down with your list of what your sort of, you know, categories are going to be and it makes it so much easier to pop those ideas in and then you can sort of go away I also find it really um, helps to get out of your normal like so, you know if you're normally at an office or you're normally at home to go and sit in a cafe or something just breaking up and giving yourself a bit of a like I'm going to sit here for however's reasonable to sit in a cafe on you know one or two cups of coffee <laughs> without being rude and you know and then get it all done um, that's always helped me as well um, but you know it's yeah I think it's just important to make sure you set a realistic schedule you can stick to because consistency does pay off. And even if that's twice a week or, you know, four times a week or whatever it is you can realistically do, I think just start there. And then obviously you can grow it later if you can get some help as well. Yeah. I love how achievable that system sounds and just having that kind of month after month, it must just be so much easier to continue to refine it to what works best. Um, now I noticed that you mentioned you switch from a blog to a podcast. Is there any sort of like data that really made you make that switch in your business? Are you finding that like a podcast is, um, like more helpful for your business in any way? Um, if people are like thinking about switching, can you talk through that decision process and kind of how it's working for you guys? Yeah, for sure. So um, for me, it, like, you know, it was well, always on my list. Like, I think I had started a podcast on the list, like for the last four or five years. I get that um, feeling. <laughs> yeah, but it, particularly when, it, you know, when I had a baby last year, um, well, sorry, a year before now, um, it became, I was like, we used to do try and do video and that just became really impractical. And then particularly around COVID, I was like, okay, I need something that I can go and hide in my stepdaughter's bedroom for a couple of hours in my pajamas if I have to, and just batch some stuff out. Um, I also found with being, you know, having broken sleep from having a baby that I couldn't write long things anymore. Like I just ran out, I felt like I just ran out of words. So like I can talk for days, that's fine, <laughs> but, but writing just wasn't happening. So um, it just seemed to make more sense mm -hmm. um, in that regards for us, just from a, like what I was actually capable of producing side of things. But I love the fact that with podcasts that it's, you know, it's similar to, you know, blog posts and that they kind of they live forever like you know we still even from popping going on to other people's podcasts and stuff every now and then when people get in touch and say you know I saw you on such and such and you know I think it's just such a um it's a yeah it's a great way to sort of get in front of other audiences and to connect um through I, don't, I know I I find it with when I listen to the same podcast over and over again you almost feel like you know these people because you know they're in your ears um, and it's a really great way of creating a bit more of a human connection as well so it's been really great for us really, really enjoying it yeah and I think that idea of creating the type of content that works in your life is so important for people to take stock of and I don't know if we do enough I think we're just like oh we need to have a blog everyone says <laughs> so but if you're not going to be able to write really great content but you could speak about really great content like that's a good sign just to keep doing that strength area so I'm really glad you brought that up um, are there any kind of lessons that you've learned through failures in your business that you could share with the community just we love being able to have people like you on here kind of have us take these shortcuts at the, um, that maybe you've learned from in the past year or so um, that you could share with us? Absolutely. Oh my gosh, I made so many, <laughs> you know, um, all the mistakes. Um, I think the biggest one for me, and it's one it, it took me, you know, this one I had to learn a couple of times was that it's okay. And it, it's similar with the content, but it is okay to sort of design your business around the actual like the lifestyle you want to have. Mm. Um, it doesn't necessarily, like not necessarily at the start, you can't go, oh, I want to work three hours a week and, you know, be spend the rest of the time on a beach. You do probably have to, to hustle a bit more, but to have, just actually sit down and take that time and figure out like, okay, well, what, what do I want? And therefore, what does that mean for like some of the big decisions in my business? Like I see a lot of the time where people are saying, oh, I want more freedom and I want more time and then they're structuring up the way they do their offers to be like really one-on-one -on -one heavy and have to do a lot of sales calls and the only way they can grow is to do more sales calls and more one-on-one -on -one. I'm like well that's kind of they don't align you're not gonna you know you're just gonna get to a point where you go 
what have I done? Like, I don't, I don't like my business anymore. And I think that's always heartbreaking because business is a lot of work and people put their, you know, blood, sweat and tears into it. And, you know, and I only say this because I've done this twice. Like I created two businesses that, you know, on paper were great businesses, but they made me miserable because they were, the way they were designed was not around the, you know, even the stuff I liked doing. So it was, you know, I think it's, worth taking the time just you know again sit down for a couple of hours and just sit down and go well, what actually do I want to be able to do from my business even if it's five years from now um, and it doesn't matter if it doesn't match up with where you are right now but once you know and you can start you know making decisions based on working towards that then you know at least you're sort of heading in the right direction um, and it will it will kind of force you to get out of that just reactive Oh, what do I have to do to make the money this month? Like, mm. which, which kind of, you know, it's, it has to be done. Bills have to be paid, but also you kind of, you have to break that cycle. Otherwise you can't move, you can't move forward. You say stay stuck in that place. So that would probably be my biggest um, advice, I think. Yeah, I love that. And having grown three businesses now, you're obviously pretty comfortable selling and promoting and putting yourself out there in that way. Are there any like mindset tips or like frequently on how much you should sell that you can offer our community that you have found work? Just because I know so many small businesses and solopreneurs are just afraid to kind of take that step and like actually explicitly sell things. Um, so how did you get over that? How have you found that's worked in all these businesses? Uh, I think it really comes down to like to be able to feel comfortable in offering your product is you almost you need to know that your product is awesome like you need to really believe in your product and then it becomes it's not so much about you asking for money it's you offering to help people um and then and it's a fair exchange like it's you know it's and i've you know like my very first offer was $197 and it was way underpriced and you know it and I was terrified of putting that out into the world and when people bought I almost felt like going like you know I'm sorry you know like you kind of have that kind of <laughs> feeling like, but it's one of those things that it does take time and practice and as you see people moving through and getting amazing results and you know how you're actually changing people's lives and all niches like it doesn't matter whether you're teaching people a hobby or you're helping people with their health or you're teaching people how to get their toddler to sleep or whatever it is like you know each of those things has a big impact on people's lives and I think you need to kind of remind yourself of that and really rem focus on like what is it that you who do you serve how do you actually help them how valuable is that to them mm -hmm. um, make sure that your product is amazing like you know make sure it's, it's you know continue I'm not saying being perfectionist but make sure that you know you've you've done the groundwork and you've um, you know you're constantly that's probably the wrong word but you know you're updating things and you're you're making sure that your offer is is solid and it does get those results um, and then you start to feel good about it. Then it's like when people buy, not rather than being like, oh gosh, you know, I feel like almost guilty for taking your money. It's like, yay, I'm so excited about helping this person. Like we're going to have a great time together. And that, that shift, it takes a little bit of time, but it makes like a big difference. Yeah, that's a really good one. I love these small tips that you could just make these huge leaps in your business through just your mindset shifts like that. So thanks for bringing that up for sure. Um, so last, I love just to end this with your ideas about online courses these days. I know you help people create these courses and you help them get them out there and create funnels for them. And I know it's kind of becoming a buzzword of getting your expertise out there and like everyone needs to scale their business with an online course. Can you talk a little bit about your ideas behind who online courses are right for um, and like how you decide to start one and if it's right for your business? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, an online course, and I'm probably one of the only people out there who will say that an online course isn't right for everybody because <laughs> for, the, for the right people, they are really amazing. I think um, it's as far as, um, yeah, it kind, of, it kind of comes back to when you're creating, coming up with your idea for your online course, you need to first of all know that it does take a little bit of time to get this all set up and get it out there and you need to be able to carve that time in your business like you know with anything that you're wanting to grow you need to be able to focus on it i'd say for at least six months not it's not like you're going to be the only thing you do but you want to you know make sure that you're going to be okay with that time frame um then like the main thing is then really really getting clear on okay who is your target market and what is like their what is like the one most valuable thing that you can help them with in the simplest way possible? Um, 
products. I know a lot of people, when they create their first course, they create what I call a kitchen sink course. So it's just like, and, and again, this comes from this feeling of not being worthy enough to charge you know, enough. And so you're like, I'm just gonna teach everything I've ever learned about <laughs> anything on this topic. And all you do is fire hose people and it just becomes too much. And that's when you get like people don't complete and they don't, you know, so it's actually better to ha- come up with like the courses that seem to take off really quickly are the ones that are like super simple. Like um, I've got a friend, her program is teaching accountants how to use Asana, like, so, you know, clear niche, clear outcome. Um, and then yeah. And then after that, it's just a matter of going, okay, I'm, go- I'm going to, you know, commit the time and just being okay with launching it and launching it again and launching it again and le- and learning. Like it's, it's, it's a process of mastery. It takes, you know, most people's first launches, unless you've got a massive email list and they've just been like dying for you to do something will be small and that's okay. But it's, you know, this is an asset that you're creating and it's one that you then, once you've created it, you know, it can help to um, particularly once you create funnels around it, if you choose to, um, you know, it can help, you know, create revenue for your business every month if you want. Um, but I think, yeah, it's just really important to, first of all, get super clear and try and keep it a, a simple promise and outcome um, and one audience, and then just be prepared to, to, to focus and refine it for like at least six months to kind of get that ball moving. Um, and, and then, yeah, then it's, um, then it's it's scale time really and that's a whole different kind of conversation but once you kind of nail that really good offer um and that really clear promise it's um and and you have like a regular promotion schedule then that's sort of how people kind of normally get things rolling oh that's the idea is so good about simpler things are actually worth more to people so often than that kitchen sink course you were talking about. And I relate to that feeling so much. So really glad you brought that up. And the idea of someone's paying you to kind of simplify this tool or simplify this concept is a hard one, I think, to put to practice, but you broke that down beautifully. So as we round out here, if there's anything else you'd love to share with our community, go ahead and let them know. And I'd love if anyone wants to go further with any of these tips that Kate brought up today for you to also share where people can find you online before we close out today yeah absolutely so I think um the main thing is that I kind of always you know when I get up my little soapbox is always <laughs> that I think a lot of people think that you know funnels are have to be difficult and complicated and they require a big investment to work and that there's something that you do later once you're already making multiple six figures but actually, you know, creating a really, taking the time, a couple of weeks to set up a really simple automation can help you to be making, you know, sales here and there from the list building that you're already doing and the marketing that you're already doing. And it just starts to add in, you know, because every little bit helps, particularly as you're getting started um, and to start knowing that you're going to have these reliable sales, even if it's only a couple, and then that will grow as you grow. Um, I think that's something that a lot of people don't realize that, you know, you can do it without ads, you can do it, you can keep it simple and you can do it sooner rather than later. And it will actually help to grow your business rather than the other way around. Um, and yeah, and, you know, obviously I'm a total nerd and I love talking about funnels all the time. And if anyone wants to find out more about funnels, then, um, you can head on over to hellofunnels.co or we're on Instagram at hellofunnels, um, and, you know, we've got lots of free resources and like I said, lots of content and stuff as well that people can dive into and start kind of getting a little taste test of how funnels can work for them. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time and your generosity and knowledge today, guys. If you have any takeaways, we'd love to hear them. We are at me Edgar across social media and be sure to subscribe for a new expert every Wednesday. Thanks again, Kate. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for tuning in and be sure to keep the conversation going with us on social. We're at Meet Edgar on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. So let us know your biggest takeaway from today's episode. And don't forget to tag us. Visit www.meetedgar.com and start a free trial to up-level your social media marketing strategy today. Happy posting.